Hi there, Rich Leiter here, and I'm going to talk about something which has been on my mind lately. It's um, kind of a um, an idea that I've been developing. Um, it's by no means um, exhaustive, that's for darn sure. But what I want to talk about is this whole notion of the prejudice I've observed that we have in our, our Western culture against simplicity. We don't seem to like simplicity. Um, we shy against it. If something is too simple, then it can't be right. We mistrust it. Um, it seems to be that, that people want, they don't want simplicity. They don't want a unified, complete, integrated picture of something. They don't want an answer, even though they say they want an answer. What they really want is the perpetuation of more and more questions. They don't want the whole, they want fragments. And I have come to the conclusion that the reason that they have this prejudice against or intolerance of simplicity um, has to do with the notion that simplicity is threatening to them and the reason that it is threatening to most people and institutions in our society is because it undermines or threatens um, the prevailing power structure there are certain people and certain institutions which are on top they're the leaders. What they say goes. And simplicity undermines that. It threatens to topple that dominance that they have. You wouldn't think this is true, why there's any sort of a correspondence between simplicity and, uh, and domin dominance, right? But I've been thinking about it, and I really think there is. Um, and I've been thinking about it in a number of fields of endeavor. It's not at all exhaustive. It's just rudimentary, but I think you'll get the idea. Let's talk about uh, academia, the institution of academia. All of those professors and academics and PhDs and graduate students and postgraduate students and tenured professors and so on and so forth, the whole, and scholars, the whole institution of academia. Well, I mean, um, to my way of thinking, it, these, these people really don't want simplicity. They want complexity. Um, they do not want, for instance, talk about English. None of these academics wants you to waltz into their office or write a thesis talking about how you understand what Moby Dick is about. You understand what Hamlet is about. And this is it. And once you get it, there's nothing further to get. They don't want that. They don't want a really definitive answer to any of the things that they study. Because remember, these academics, they make their living lecturing about the, the, uh, the, the unfathomable complexity of Shakespeare or Herman Melville or whoever it may be. That's how they pay their mortgages. Do you think they want somebody waltzing in and telling them the way it really is of giving them an insight that obviates the need for their lecturing anymore? 
No, they don't want that. They want you, they, they say, of course, they all say they want you to give them further insight. For instance, I mean, this could be anything. They want you to give them further insight into a famous author. They all say that, you know, but they really don't. What they want is, they want you to bow down at the icon or the altar of Shakespeare or Melville or Faulkner or Hemingway, you name it. They want you to bow down and just keep finding more and more bits of complexity that will add to the myth of that particular author. That's what they're looking for. They don't want simplicity, they want complexity. It's kind of like um, JFK. Who killed JFK? Well, by this time, how many years has it been now? 60 years after the fact? Um, I mean, the question, who killed JFK, is kind of irrelevant now. There have been so many theories concerning who killed JFK that it's, it's, it's not even a field of of serious endeavor anymore, of serious study. The who, the who killed JFK notion is now has now been elevated into myth. So whatever you have to say about it, it's not going to clarify who killed JFK. It's just going to add to the myth. And that's what they want. They want the legend, the legend to continue. And how do you get the legend to continue and to prosper? by always coming up with more and more little bits and pieces. Well, that's what they want in academia. They want the legend and the myth of Shakespeare or whoever it is. They want that to continue forever. And that way, their jobs remain intact. Their institution remains intact. And they can go on their merry way, generating money and calling the shots uh, and always saying to you, yes, yes, that's a very, very good thing you said there, but keep looking, keep looking. It's more complex than you think. They're doing this to maintain their positions of power. It's not just an idea I have. I mean, I went to college. I was thinking of going to grad school. I certainly rubbed noses with enough um, grad students and, and teachers and scholars there. I was very popular with them such an enthusiastic young man. So I, I, I actually feel that this is more than just a, uh, a clever thought. Let's take another field. How about religion? It's just about the same thing, you know? The main thing about religion is you're down here, mere mortal man, and God is up there. And there is no way that you can ever bridge the gap between you and the guy upstairs. Now they give you they give you um, they give you conflicting signals, just like they do in uh, academia. In academia, the 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 cover story is that they want you to elucidate the meaning of Hamlet. But like I say, the backstory, which is the real story, is they really don't. They want you to just add to the complexity. They want you to add to the myth or to the legend. Same is true in religion. All religions, I think, as far as I know, I'm no expert on religion at all, but common knowledge from having lived on the earth. What do they want? The cover story is they all say they want you to be Christ-like or they want you to be saint-like, saintly, right? They want you to be that. That's the cover story. But they don't want you to be too saintly or too Christ-like because if you actually got too much like Christ or too much like Moses or whoever it is in whatever religion, that starts getting them very, very uneasy. Because what would happen if you were a person who actually became extremely saintly, all the things that they tell you that you should be, 
St. Francis of Assisi. I mean, I mean, history is full of people who actually took religion seriously and became saint-like. The prevailing religions don't like that because it, it questions and undermines their authority. If you become too saint-like, well, maybe you don't need these Talmudic scholars and these the priests to be the gatekeepers for you, the mediator between you and the man upstairs. So they don't want you to really be too saint-like. They want you to be blind, confused, sinners. If you want to think of it in terms of Christianity, they want that. It's a mixed message. In other words, no matter what insight you have into divinity, it's never going to be enough because it's always more and more complex. That's why you go to divinity school or rabbinical school. What do you do there? Do you, you immerse yourself in complexity. You study God as if you're studying how to build an engine for an automobile. It's all about complexity. It's not about simplicity. Um, you know, it's very funny because in, in, in the Western tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, this division, this dualistic division between you, the mortal man, and God, the unknowable divinity is a very clear-cut distinction. And for a person to claim that they are Christ or Christ so or Christ-like or God or God-like, that's anathema in our Western culture. Compare that to Eastern culture. You know, there's a saying, um, uh, it's a very famous saying, um, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. In other words, it's not you and then Buddha's God. No. The West, the Eastern tra tradition um, espouses the notion, the concept, that each person has the capability of becoming enlightened as the Buddha did, of becoming the Buddha. So in other words, you kill the Buddha on the road because you're not looking up to the Buddha. There's no separation. You are to become the Buddha. And there have been um, saint gurus, yogis, uh, ascetics throughout Eastern, Eastern philosophy who, who claim uh, to have reached that Buddha-like state of awareness. So it's not considered anathema in the East. That's where it's at in the East. So apparently the East is not quite as hypocritical as the West is. The East actually wants simplicity. They don't want obfuscation and endless complexity in order to keep the power structure where it is, the prevailing power structure. So that's just, again, off the cuff. That's the second uh, field of endeavor where I would say the complexity is what's really um, desired by the gatekeepers. How about medicine? Well, I mean, again, this is just off the top of my head. The first thing that leaps out at me is the whole cancer industry. I mean, this is not a great secret. I mean, everybody knows that there is a cancer industry, a multi-billion dollar um, cancer industry. Um, the war on cancer has been declared since, what is it, the 60s? It's been over a half a century, 60 years. And of course, it's a very complex industry, isn't it? It's very complex because the uh, researchers are constantly, constantly looking for new and better ways to treat cancer. And of course, they're not doing such a great job, are they, after 60 years? Not in my opinion, anyway. You have cancer, 
you're not going to feel that good. It's not like having a cold and just taking an antibiotic and you're going to be pretty sure you're going to get rid of that cold. You don't feel that way if you come down with cancer. There are certain advances that have been made in cancer. It's true. But nothing, nothing what it should be after 60 years, in my humble opinion. Now, of course, ever since 1913, um, when um, the Federal Reserve was created and the American Medical Association, we've been a oil-based, a petroleum-based um, um, pharmaceutical industry. We've tried to find drugs to treat cancer based, on, based upon petroleum. And so obviously it requires chemistry. It's, 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 uh, it, it's a very, very complicated endeavor. Um, and nowadays, I understand, I've heard this, the new buzz is, the new trend, is to start treating cancer genetically. So in other words, they'll take um, your DNA, every person's DNA, and they will tailor make a cure, uh, an injection, a drug, tailor-made for your specific DNA. This is where it's headed now. Sounds pretty complicated, doesn't it? Can you imagine the amount of research and the amount of resources and the amount of money that's going to go into making a tailor-made cancer drug just for you out of the 8 billion plus people living on this planet? Now, of course, there are many, many alternative forms of cancer treatment which are not acknowledged by allopathic medicine. They're plant-based, they're not petroleum-based. And they just will reject them out of hand. Some of these uh, methods, um, there are many of them, there's a, tea, there's a tea out there called Essiac that was just um, discovered by accident by a nurse in Canada. She happened to, 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 to find it by accident from a Canadian Native American Indian who just took some roots. I think there were four different kinds of uh, plants or roots. He made a tea out of them. And apparently it's it's cured tens of thousands of people. It did when she was practicing this particular woman, uh, this nurse. It was very simple to make, and it worked. And there are many, many other um, alternative forms of, of therapy, simple forms that have been used and that apparently work. The Harry Hoxie method, another one. He just happened to, Harry Hoxie just happened to uh, observe his one of his horses nibbling on some kind of a root or grass the horse was sick and it began nibbling on this and the horse cured itself and he began investigating it and apparently the harry hoxie method has also had amazing success there are many many other th forms of alternative therapy i'm not an expert on them but the point is that every single one of these alternatives to chemotherapy surgery and radiation therapy have been soundly rejected by allopathic medicine by the institution um, because it well, obviously it threatens the institution it threatens this the, the money maker you know um, if you have too much success with one of these um, alternative methods they'll, they'll they'll hound you and harass you and lock you up Legally, they'll do this to you. Everybody knows this. I'm not saying anything which is groundbreaking. So the point is, in the field of met a cancer anyway, they go for complexity, for never-ending complexity. And anything which seems to work, which isn't the complex, they will reject out of hand because it will threaten to topple their dominance complexity. 
not simplicity. How about in art? That's a good one too, art. You know, um, Chopin, the composer, extolled the virtues of simplicity. He strove for simplicity. He struggled to achieve simplicity in his, com in his compositions. I don't have the exact quote, but that's what he said. I came across this recently. I think it was in one of his letters or something. And Mahler, Gustav Mahler, who was not too shabby either when it came to composing symphonies, he said, I always remember this, he said, interesting is easy, but beautiful is difficult. What did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was, to me, to do something in an interesting way, a complex way, it's interesting. You take it apart, you, you talk about all the different uh, uh, facets, the complex facets of it. It makes for good talk. It's, it's, it's okay. But to simplify and to streamline and to get to the one basic thing, the concept that you were struggling to get for, that's what makes the piece beautiful. That ain't so easy to do. You know, um, I read a book recently by an artist, Paul Rhodes. He wrote a book called Art in the Age of Anxiety. And he says that the great masters never drew things with clinical precision. There were two hallmarks of the great masters, simplicity, simplification, and caricature. Again, they didn't just want mindless complexity. Um, they wanted a kind of a beautiful simplicity. I mean, they understood what the anatomy was. They, were, they, they, they knew how to draw, but once they had mastered it, they were able to manipulate things and, ma and, and make it simpler. Data, oceans of data, which one is bombarded with, that do not elevate the human spirit, are meaningless. And right nowadays, with, with the great inc advances in, in technology that we have, what are we? We're bombarded with bits and pieces of data and the more we're bombarded with them the less they mean they mean nothing what do they do for the human spirit you know what they do for the human spirit they crush the human spirit they tell the human spirit you're nothing because you don't know everything the way our computers can spit them out you don't have the complexity that our computers do and our technology does. So who are you, Mr. Individual Human Being? You're nothing. They crush the human spirit with their data. They use the data for duplicitous purposes to confuse you, to blind you, to lead you astray, and ultimately to demoralize you. That's what complexity without a conscience does that doesn't lift the human spirit. So, um, that's, that's, that's my thesis. My thesis is that we live in a world which is predominantly, well, we live in a world which is controlled by certain people and institutions. I mean, I don't know, look, I don't know what lies beyond the grave. I don't know any of that stuff, what God is, if there is any life on other planets. I mean, I'm convinced that there is, how can there not be? Uh, with the, 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 the number of stars and star systems out there, but I don't know. I don't know anything about 
what lies beyond the grave, or what's at the end of the universe, nothing. But I do know about this life that I'm living now. And why do I know? Why am I an expert on what's going on in this life? I'll tell you why I'm an expert. I don't have any PhD or MD or PSY letters at the end of my name, but I consider myself an expert anyway. And do you know why? Well, I'll tell you. Because I've managed to live on this earth for 71 years as an intelligent person, a discriminating person with common sense, my wife will tell you that I don't have common sense, but common sense in certain ways, I can think for myself, and I managed to make it for 71 years without blowing my brains out. That makes me an expert. I know just as much as the next person about this life. And what I know about this life is that this life is all about control. It shouldn't be. It should be about justice and compassion and mercy and all that good stuff that we're, that we're told um, the world is run on when we were young. But it's not. It's run by a bunch of control freaks and people who want dominance and want to maintain their dominant positions. It's very sad. These people do not want the human race to evolve. They want us to remain blind and confused and dependent upon them. And it's been this way for thousands of years and mankind has gotten a raw deal. We deserve better than that. You know, Nietzsche said, I think it was in Thus Spake Zarathustra, man is a worm. And that's right. Man is a worm. And he has been kept down as a worm for a long, long time. And sometimes I feel very agitated and upset by the fact that man could be so much more than he is and look at him look at him we have the control freaks on top who have bamboozled and confused us and then we have the sheep on the bottom who want to be led it's a horrible horrible state of affairs I mean, like Louis Armstrong said, what a wonderful world, right? And it is a wonderful world. It's a wonderful world without man. Robertson Jeffers, the poet, felt the same way. The earth is wonderful, all of the green grass and the trees and the seas and the oceans and the cliffs and the mountains and the clouds and the stars. Wow. Man. Man fucks it all up. And man is not evolving. Man is devolving. And so to end this little talk or rant or whatever it is, my point is this, there is a prejudice against simplicity because it keeps the power structure intact. Thank you.